Mr. Misfit. Hey everybody, welcome back. The brilliance of my mind messed up the calendar again. Brandon is still on vacation, even though last week I told you he was back. But instead, Joe has decided to come back because there's a conversation that he and I have been wanting to have to define some terms that both of us use regularly, but I don't think either one of us have ever actually sat down and just defined in an episode before. So we... Joe, Joe's back, Buddy Walk is back. We're going to be talking about Christocentric theology, but what Christocentric in general actually means. So, Joe, let's start with you. Have you ever actually sat down and defined it for anybody? Or is this something that you're finally getting to do that you've been meaning to do for a while? Uh, this is the first time in front of the microphone. I've had conversations with um, with the house church and, and with different people um, along the way about what exactly it means to be to have a Christocentric theology. Um, but yeah, in a in a public display, this is this is the first time, and and it's good because. I don't think I realized in endeavoring into this world of ministry. I think it's one of the one of the ways where my entry into ministry um, kind of kind of limited my perspective a little bit. You know what I mean? Like a lot of the time when this conversation takes place of of my not coming in with all the baggage and all the denominational nonsense and I, I tend to use the phrase footloose and fancy free a lot. Um, because it is it is applicable. There is a, a certain amount of garbage that I don't that I don't come in with, but um it's also easy to miss how easily missed this whole this whole concept is which was for me a little bit of a I say culture shock i don't know how else to say it uh, it was it was because to me it's just you read the text right and you're like yeah no this makes sense i don't understand why this doesn't make sense to more people but then you open the lens out to a wider demographic and you realize at least in at least in the west um this is one of the more easily missed concepts. And that's part of why we want to actually take the time to define it right now, because this is one of the things that also just within the past month or so, the amount of people that do not understand what we mean when we say Christocentric or that have a politicized, yes, even with this, there's a politicized view of it. Mm -hmm. has gotten much more evident in conversations. So we're going to just define it very easily, very quickly, before we get into what it's not. Right. Christo, meaning Christ. Centric, meaning centered. Very easy. It's not complicated. Christocentric means that it is Christ-centered. Now, mm -hmm. what that is not is this is not red-letter Christianity. Right. If you don't know what red-letter Christianity is, most Bibles, when Jesus talks, has the his words in red. Red-letter Christianity says that those are the only words in the Bible that we actually need to pay attention to. That is not what we're talking about. We also are not talking about the Jesus cult which is the idea of Jesus as God, Jesus as savior jesus as messiah but no father no spirit it's all just jesus all the time this is why it's important for us to actually sit down and have the conversation is that even this idea of a christ-centered theology and a christ-centered christianity is abused and misused a lot 
So we're going to actually walk through what it means and why it's important here. Misfits have heard this phrase often all the way back to episode one. We talked about this with Bradley Barnes. We've talked about this with Dr. Linville multiple times. We use the phrase all the time. And most of the time it's related to our three tiers. We're talking Christocentric theological truths that build out our biblically based philosophical principles that inform how we do our methodological models. It all goes back to the theology that we're built on. But why the theology needs to be Christocentric is the first step. So, Joe, you don't necessarily work within the three-tier paradigm all the time, at least not intentionally. What? Why is it for you that the Christocentric model is so important? So, if you approach the Bible as a, not to steal their gimmick, but a continuous narrative that points to Jesus, then the, the mode in which God operates makes a lot more sense throughout time of memoriam. Also, you realize that along the way, you are you you have more and more of the character of God being displayed in different situations, in different settings, and all of that kind of stuff. And when you really dig into what 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 the popular comparisons are of what like if if not christocentric then what it's not overly surprising considering this is these are things that man has wrestled with when trying to reconcile what the messiah is for Forever. time and memoriam <laughs> yeah um by understanding things through the lens of a christocentric theology um opens the door to the rest of, a lot of the other stuff that we have a tendency to talk about. So last week we talked about um, Tim Keller and we talked a lot about um, our different ministry stylings and how we view people and all of that kind of stuff. Well, viewing people through the lens of the Imago Dei, viewing the world through the lens of the living kingdom, different things like that, that, that stems from what we're talking about here. And understanding that Jesus was always plan A, that it wasn't a matter of this certain certain references of the Old Testament being, sure, messianic, but not specifically referring to Jesus, that opens the door to things like dispensationalism. And stuff like that. And I'm not trying to make I think I think sometimes dispensationalism is just another one of the boogeymen that that gets created and all of that kind of stuff. And like it becomes this big thing. And, you know, we have to be we, you know, we have to make sure that we don't, you know, end up there or whatever like that. But the reality is that if if in in order to really reconcile what the narrative of the Bible is getting at, we need to understand that it's always been the same timeline. It's always been the same, uh, the 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 same direct path in narrative, not changing from time period to time period. And you know the interesting thing with that is that you know when we talk about how to read the Old Testament. This is one of those areas where, again, even a Christocentric model gets abused. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, um, Rabbi Mike, who uh, a lot of people on Twitter probably know who I'm referring to as for, for Rabbi Mike. He's one of the more well-known rabbis within the U.S. that have an online presence. He unfortunately has a very bad view of Christians because of this idea. Because we say 
we need to read the Old Testament with a Christocentric view. But there's a lot of prophecy and other things in the Old Testament that we read as Christians with the Christocentric view that have a secondary meaning. The entirety of Isaiah deals with the centrality of Christ, but at the same time deals with the centrality of the problems of that time period in Israel. Right. And when we don't recognize that, then we fall victim we fall into whether it's dispensationalism, whether it's Jesus cult, whether it's whatever it is, we lose part of the story that helps us understand why Jesus had to come in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus is not the only Messiah that we have in the Bible. And I'm sure that's the quote that's going to get cut out by somebody and thrown around. But Oh yeah, that's it's that's not. a that, that is absolutely going to get clipped. Absolutely. Because what do we what do we have again just looking at Isaiah? Cyrus is called out as Messiah by God some 200 300 years before he's even born. Because Israel needed a Messiah. Israel needed the Messiah. He had to come and rescue them from bondage. It doesn't take away, though, from the centrality of Christ within the passage. And this is what we see in Colossians 1 as far as why we're saying Christ was plan A, even though we see other plans unfold throughout the Old Testament. This is starting in verse 15 in Colossians 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Everything goes back to Christ. He has reconciled everything to himself because... He is God. Straightforward, that's why. He is God. He reconciles everything to himself because that is what God does. That's why when we read the Genesis narrative, God doesn't tell Adam and Eve, oh, if you eat of the tree, you will die. He says, when you eat this, you are going to die. He already knows what's about to take place. Because God had the plan in place already for us to be able to experience him in his fullness. And the fullness of God is found in Christ. Which is why we read everything through that kind of a lens. And now right. go ahead and and tell me why your head is about to explode there, Joe. <laughs> well, so a lot of times when um, this kind of thing comes up, it, people tend to struggle with um, approaching this from a reactionary mindset, mm -hmm. right? Because we are a reactionary creature. We assume... And the only way that we can that we can process through things is to put those same attributes onto God, and that's part of why. Um, you it it's part of why I, I I really do fundamentally wish more people really understood the first part of John three sixteen. Right, we talk about salvation, and we talk about that as this 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 phrase that's or this verse that's at the heartbeat of um salvation we'll take take the beat and read read the verse what is the first part of that verse for god so 
loved the world. And to think and sit and rest in the realities that God, that God loves you. God understands your screw-ups. God understands your shortcomings. God understands that you are still trying to figure out what it means to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he loves you. And a lot of the time when I hear pushback against a Christocentric theology, it's this idea that, um, well, if, if Christ was always the plan, then why create Adam and Eve? Mm -hmm. Because you, because it's almost like this idea that you know you're creating a flawed creation. Okay, okay. So let's 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 work with that for a second. If that's if that's something that's confounding, let's work let's work with that. So let's say okay, God knows that Adam and Eve are going to fall, and that there would ultimately need to be. Uh, 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 a a a an intermediary on our behalf, and so he just decides, ah, they're gonna not, they're gonna mess up. Well, that means no you. That means no us. That means no humanity. Just being, if if we are if we are speaking in terms of concrete terms, and we are working with the assumption that God is real, Jesus is real, the hev the heavenly realms are uh, are real, and we're talking about this pow this cosmic powwow of whether or not to create humanity and all of that kind of stuff, and we're working within that paradigm, then work within that paradigm and 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 extrapolate it out to its natural conclusion. But the idea to go back to love is that understanding that there would be a need, they got God still created and then worked towards this eventuality that this is something that that would happen and and that that Christ's life and death and resurrection would happen. And when you understand that and then you read Christ into if you look up a if you look up a textbook definition, they're going to say that a Christocentric theology is reading Christ into every page of the mm -hmm. Old Testament. It's 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 hyperbole. It's not. Let's not let's not get hung up on on specifics here. As far as every single page and all of that kind of stuff. But if you read Christ into, if you read Jesus into the Old Testament, then you understand that that John three sixteen, that same idea, that same mode of being, that same orientation, that same character attribute that we see fully displayed in plain English present throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. And you see this continue the, this continued narrative that that it is the same God now then and forever, just like it is the same kingdom now then and forever just like it's the same the the same um purpose for things like the law things like following god things like why even have um the t the 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 tenants and the ways and all of that kind of stuff and we could sit here and 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 wax poetically about the specifics and trying to wrap our mind around all of those things but guys i i know that the buddy walk community hears me talk a lot about this um more spiritual side of reconciling our faith and all of that and i know for you guys over here a lot of what you guys talk about is more applicable to um 
I'm going to say applicable to everyday life, but it's more grounded, I guess is a good way of putting it. It's more of the human element piece and all of that. Not to say it's devoid of spiritual things, but it's more, you guys talk a lot about political, sociological topics and concepts and all of that kind of stuff. Um, rather than trying to sit and wax poetically about every single theological concept and every and, and trying to reconcile every single little piece every single part of the way let's take a step back and just sit in the wonder that if we are if we are bible believing christians right if we are all if, if we all at least you know, with all of our differences in all of our different takes on different matters of the world and all of that kind of stuff, if we all at least stop to say, okay, the one thing that we can all agree on is that we are Christians. Okay, cool. Then, then, then take a step back, take the beat and say, okay, so the best, the one thing that I can know is that the God of everything, the creator of everything loves me and knew from jump that I would need a savior and did all of that. All of the preponderance of backstory that goes into that, all of the historicity that goes, that goes into all of that, that that was always plan A was to provide a means of reconciliation. That's the power of understanding and reconciling this whole idea of a Christocentric theology. Yes, there are things that are more applicable to everyday life, ways that it in does inform how we uh, go through this world and how we um, interpret diff different things and how we operate, all, all the whole nine yards, yes. But there's... The, the big picture does so much for being able to do things like rest in the story. Do things like be able to have, have hope when, when the one thing that you want more than anything else on this planet is just, just, a, just a little bit of slice of a piece, slice of peace. Mm -hmm. right just a little bit of peace and when when you stop to realize that you realize that that along the way the 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 main one that comes to mind because i would reckon that and some some old testament scholar someplace may may tell me that it may tell me different but but you tend to think of isaiah as as the book when when you talk about messianic prophecy mm -hmm. in the old testament and but 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 it's not just isaiah there are countless examples of people referencing a coming messiah a coming savior reconciliation for god's people now yes again time place context context matters so at that point in time they were talking about the the jewish people but then we get the old or we get the new testament jew gentile so on and so forth and we know i mean I, i'm gonna assume that the people listening to this know the story if not, um, go go do Patreon and join the Galatians Bible study where we go through all of it. Smooth. Exactly. Well, you know, part of what you're talking about there, though, is something that, you know, why, why we talk about the idea of Christocentric theology being the place that everybody needs to start is this idea of it actually does provide unity. Mm-hmm. You know, this is John 17, Jesus praying in the garden. The one thing he prays for is unity for the believers under his name. Let them all be united as we are united. Unite them under my name. Jesus is supposed to be the thing that unites all believers. Mm -hmm. That is 
normally widely accepted as, yeah, obviously we know that. But then when we start getting into actual discussions with people, what unites us is no longer whether or not we claim the name of Jesus. It's what version of Jesus we claim. Or what it's, ancillary topic outside of right. Jesus supersedes the importance of Jesus. But we claim that it's this version of Jesus because we need to have Jesus agree with us on everything. Yep. Because if Jesus at least agrees on with us ones. on everything, then obviously that means that we're more important and we have the authority to be able to do what we're saying we want to do. Mm -hmm. This is why we talk about the idea of theology having to be Christocentric. Because if your theology is Christocentric, your theology is centered on Christ, yeah. it allows us to actually determine what is actually a primary, what is a secondary, and what is a tertiary, and what is a whatever the further down the list we go actually is. Right. Because if what we are preaching draws us closer to Christ... It's obviously going to be a primary doctrine. If we don't preach this, we miss a piece of Jesus, or we do not get to Christ, it's a problem. We need to make sure this is a, a primary. If what we are preaching helps us understand Jesus, but even if we don't have that, we still understand Jesus, it's probably a secondary. You know, Water baptism versus, you know, versus the dry cleaning is a secondary issue because either way, the commitment to Jesus is at the center of the story. We're still proclaiming Christ as Lord at the end of all of it. So the method is not as important as the pro proclamation of Jesus as Lord. That's exactly. what a Christocentric theology view of baptism ends up looking like. But when we have a non-Christocentric view of theology, or we start to put non-essential non doctrines as essential, we end up losing sight of where Christ is at in the midst of all of it. Right. And this is why we are having the discussion, because part of where I get yelled at a lot is when we start talking about the doctrine of heaven and hell related to Christocentric theology is an easy example to show what we mean when we have a doctrine that is important but when we look at it outside of a Christocentric lens, if your view of the afterlife is centered on where you are ending up, not whether or not Christ is Lord at the end of it, it's where you are ending up or what's becoming more common, where the person you don't like is ending up. Christ is not at the center. And how do we know that? It's because of the way that, you know, walking through our three tiers, it's because of the way that we can then see how we are thinking about that topic and how it ends up being applied within our lives. Mm -hmm. If hell is the center, getting away from it, or making sure the people you don't like end up there, it's going to affect the way that you approach the rest of the top the rest of the world in general why is it that everybody is freaking out right now about target why is everybody freaking out about target right now what's the big boycott do you smart 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 me up man because i've seen i've seen a couple of posts about target but i i didn't realize i don't know what well, it is we're going into about. june and it's not just birthday month in June. 
It's also what in June? It's Pride Month, right? This is it. It's oh, Pride it is, Month, isn't it? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, it's Pride yeah, Month. Like Target has already because stores, for whatever reason, start doing things like three months in advance, and so you can't ever find what you need during the season that you need it. Tangent, whatever. The the pro they've already started putting out their Pride Month stuff. And yeah. there is a large group of Christians that are calling to boycott Target because they're putting out all the LGBT stuff already. However, where was the outrage when they started painting, started putting things in their in the store that were crosses painted as American flags? Right. There's idolatry yep. there also. Mm -hmm. There's a major problem there. But why do we freak out about the Pride Month stuff, but not about the Cold War theology idolatry? Because when we're focused on a hell-centric gospel, the people that we don't like doing the sins we don't like have to end up in hell. And so now all of a sudden everything is about fighting back against the powers of hell rather than a focus on the centrality of Christ. And so, we freak out and turn an issue of the world being the world into a matter of life and death for Christians. Right. Because we need to make sure that hell is filled with people that we don't like, so that way heaven is clear of it. Right. So I got I, I got you. Let me let me go ahead and take some of the heat for a second. Um, dear, I'm gonna start this off like a dear Abby, uh, dear Abby letter. Dear, dear Abby. Christians, dear Christians, if if you've got heat with Target for what they publicize and all of that stuff, and you shop at either Amazon or Walmart. Mm-hmm. Take a step back and do some due diligence. That's all I'm going to say. I'm going to leave it there. But if you're going to get hot at them for it, do your due diligence when you're the next time that you sign into Amazon. And if you're going to paint with a brush, then have the integrity to paint with a brush straight across, straight across the board. I'm just saying that if that's really something that you're going to hold as a live or die conviction... And as somebody who, who I, I, I love supporting small business, so I do think it's annoying when small businesses have their political affiliation gimmicks in, the, in their front yard. So I'm not free from having an opinion as far as what this and that uh, and all that kind of stuff it annoys me because I don't care. I, I don't I don't care how you vote. That's 100 percent irrelevant. Um. <laughs> Again, like I said, I'm going to take some of the heat. I'm good. I'm good with it. It's it's cool. I'm I I'm a heat magnet in this part of town, um, because I don't care. Because it's yeah. There you go. Um, I because I I coming coming in from from the road that I come in from and the on ramp that I get that I get to these kinds of conversations. Um, I I I I see the nonsense for what it is, and I'll call out the nonsense for what it is. So like if you're going to if you're going to hold yourself to that if you are going to put that burden of weight around your own neck then just ride or die do it like you you've got you then then at least have the integrity to do it straight across the board anyway um so we're talking about heaven and hell well, and, and the the thing you've got there though is is part of the key if you're going to say ride or die just do it then do it but you've got to acknowledge why you're doing it right don't blame this on well jesus has told me to do this and i have a christocentric theology so that's why i'm doing it a right. christocentric theology doesn't require us to go boycott everybody we disagree with a no. christocentric theology calls us to love the people we disagree with right a christocentric right. theology is one that is not focused on where people end up or making sure people know where they end up because what that is is an ends the ends justify the means or in this case the ends justify the mean 
of the way that we are treating other people. Because we are taking something that is a, in a lot of cases, and honestly, the idea of what hell is or what heaven is, is not an essential doctrine. It's not. If you think that it is, it's not a Christocentric theology. Because Christ has called us to care about the people in front of us, not care only about the where we're going in the end. That's part of what we see in Acts chapter 1. Jesus goes but, up to heaven, and what do the angels do have to do to get the disciples to actually act? Remember the story? Uh, Jesus' ascension. No, Jesus yeah. ascends into heaven. The disciples are all there, and they're all looking up and watching. Yeah. He goes and he disappears, and they're still standing there watching. And finally, two angels show up and say, why are you staring up at the clouds? Right. He's already told you what you need to do. Go do it. Right. And that is what we end up with a lot of the time when we have this sort of mindset of it's all about salvation. It's all about soul winning. It's all about getting out of hell. It's all about getting into heaven. It's all about insert some eschatological idea here. Is that we are still stuck looking up at the clouds rather than going and doing what we were commanded to do in the first place. Well, let me let me let's let's hit the pause button because because yes, we started talking about something that's a little bit sarcastic in 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 how a per a person chops based off of nonsense. Um but you you covered a lot of ground there, but the thing that I'm coming to realize is that I think far too often we give people too much credit. And I'm not trying to insult your audience. But when you look at the wide angle view, I think sometimes Christians have a bad habit of saying people just want to do this. People just think this way. I think a lot of people don't know what they don't know and don't realize what they don't know. And right. I think part of the problem here is we've, we, we are operating off of an assumption that that there are terms that have been defined that for some have never been defined that most of the time when heaven and hell are referenced they are preached in a way that are ultimate endpoints and that's part of why um <laughs> i i've jokingly said that if you do not fundamentally understand the scandal of the living kingdom and why for so why for so many people that's so scandalous either you believe in it or you don't understand it because operating under the paradigm of the living kingdom living in a way where god's authority is the highest authority and understanding the ripple effects thereof the supernatural relationship that between god and man the impact that living by god's ways me that what that has and understanding that it is a matter of taking taking the bible at its word when it states that if we seek after god what we're going to find them and operating there takes the emphasis off of heaven and hell. So if we're going to sit here and talk about heaven and hell, then let's go ahead and define what that is, at least to the best that we can, right? So a lot for a lot of people, hell, we think of things like um, hellfire and brimstone, uh, eternal damnation. For some people, um, what's the, uh, is it annihilism? Is that what the... the Annihilationism, the, yeah. Annihilationism. Yeah. Um, Nihilism you know, and, is a completely different philosophical thing we don't have time to get into. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I said a nihilism, not yeah. nihilism. Nihilism is a conversation that I would love to come back and have. Um, but that that is that tends to be what we think of, and it, and uh, whether or not we we cop to it or not, many of us think of hell in the sense of God throwing people there. Heaven, we have we think we of, have the John Edwards view coming out of sinners in the hands of an angry God. Most people, you know, most, and this is something that we we talked about a while ago. Most people's view, like if we tell them to picture heaven, or to picture hell, sorry, not heaven, <laughs> to picture hell, you get a combination of sinners in the hands of an angry God and Dante's Inferno. And that, and, and and so, on the other side, you have heaven that, um, hopefully, at least you're far enough along to say, I understand that this is something that is tangible, and we're not just ethereal beings floating on clouds. Some people think that way, but whatever. Um, but the through line between the two, the continuity between the two is that for heaven, it is eternally being in the presence of God. It is, it, it, it is being present in the real way. We live in a shadow of what will be currently. And if, for those of you who never have, if you want a beautiful, illustration of what we're talking about here go and read the narniad it mm -hmm. is the single most beautiful illustration of this outside of the bible but likewise hell there's a reason why lewis calls the the residents of hell successful rebels to the end because what is what is god's preferred will Got that now that's something that a million different people just went off in 57 different directions uh, about but but God's preferred will is that no man shall perish right and if that's the case we we have to understand that along the way there's always this 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 invitation into the Christian life into the gospel and and this this constant of um you 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 have these opportunities more than once multiple times to accept or reject the gospel and that doesn't mean oh i've accepted it so i've gone in front of the church and did did a sinner's prayer and an altar call and all that kind of stuff no 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 have you accepted christ as king and that understanding that as the paradigm of hell hell is eternal separation from god okay track with me here because i'm gonna bring it back full uh, full circle if the people that you don't like you want them to be in hell that means that you want them eternally separated from god what does that say and how does that that line up with the character of the citizen of the kingdom of God as it's plainly laid out in the Bible. I'm not even talking about needing to pull out your strongs yet because there mm -hmm. are there is power in doing word studies. And, and now that I've gotten to the point of teaching people, Matthew, not just like not not just reading it myself, but like either on on the uh, on buddy walk or now i'm being asked to step into other circles and teach this stuff and teach the realities of what jesus was talking about with the sermon on the mount even before you hit the point where you need a word study you can already surmise and understand that we should be operating under the same paradigm that 
that that that Jesus did and and that we that that these are the ways of God, right? God's will, we we are in relationship with the all-knowing creator being that says I prefer that no man shall perish. And look, I don't necessarily like everybody. I'm kind of ownery sometimes. I understand kind of. that I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand I don't always play well in the sandbox, especially with other Christians. But my heart's desire is that everybody will come to understand the wonder of the all-knowing creator God that sent his son in, and you go into the story. And that well, and that's that's part of what we're talking about right now, as far as what the story actually is, right? Because if we actually believe what we keep telling people, we believe that it's all about Jesus, then that means that it's all about Jesus, and what Jesus has said is, he does not want all men to perish. Doesn't and and this is something that you know this this came up the other day. Somebody accused me of being a universalist, and my response was that I'm not a universalist, but I really hope that this is one of those areas where God tells me that I'm wrong. Because if I'm wrong and it is universalism. Why would why if I have a Christ centered view of theology would that make me upset to be wrong here? Because that means that Christ has gotten exactly what his desire is, which is that no man shall perish. That means that everybody is able to experience the Creator. That means that everybody is able to be reconciled unto Christ out of Colossians 1 again. If we are celebrating people's demise, then we do not have a Christocentric theology and definitely not a Christocentric gospel. And this is why it's so important because it, and like we said, it affects the way we view everything else. Mm -hmm. Because if our view requires damnation and hellfire, people have to suffer. How then, when it comes time to talk about things like loving our neighbor, are we able to actually discuss loving our neighbor Without the question coming up again of, well, who is my neighbor? Because somebody has to suffer within my view. This is part of why we have the discussion coming up all the time right now, coming out of Matthew 25, as far as whether or not Christians even have to help non-believers. Because if our view is centered in just on sin and punishment then non-believers get what they deserve. And only Christians deserve to have some kind of redemption and reconciliation happening. Well, let me let me expand out what you said a little bit. So I'll, I'll do you a solid and plug one of your episodes. I was on here um, after... Oh, it breaks my heart that I cannot remember which school shooting it was because there's been, there's been a lot over the last year plus. Um, but we came on here, I came on here and we were talking about gun rights and, and all of that. And you had said in our worldview, non-believers get what, what's coming to them. Man, I wish that it was that nuanced. It would still be incorrect, but I wish it would I wish at least it was that nuanced because at least then that level of thought process went into it to make it at least that nuanced. But when you talk about something like that, when you talking when you talk about um 
gun rights or abortion control or any of that stuff. And you go with a, a stance that leads with moralism. Then anybody who is against the moral standard. Screw them. They don't. They, 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 that they don't matter. Mm hmm. Not unless they, not unless they, they reorient and not unless they, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Now, there are some people that are listening to this that would say, well, wait a minute. What's wrong with being moral? Well, wait a minute. What's wrong with fearing God? Okay. Let's hang, hang, hang with me for a second. <clears throat> I've talked about this before. And, and you can go back if you didn't listen to last week's um, episode when when Brother Matthew and I were were on here. Um, I, I, I use the analogy of doing a lot of field medicine in in the type of ministry that I do. Um, part of that, part of the, the, the folks that I have been charged with caring for is are people that have experienced that that whole idea of fear god now i understand that there are different parts of the bible that talk about fear the fear of the lord um closer to the word reverence but that's again let's let's we have tools let's use them um but when you lead with fear god that does not take time to care about the individual and if you think that establishing a fear of god can at least serve even if it's messy as an on-ramp that's acceptable and that is an acceptable way of presenting the gospel then then one of two things is true either you've never sat with somebody who's been damaged or you don't care and if you don't care then might i suggest wrestling with that it's not my job to sit here and tell you and 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 say, oh, that means you're not a that ain't my that ain't my gig. That's above my pay grade. I'm not that that's not my job. But that says something, and it's not a good something. And well, and, and I don't mean to pick on anybody when I say that, but but when we talk about these things, and it's it's true on uh, it's true on every side, right? Let's I, I touched on two different uh, two different viewpoints, but. If the first thing, if the initial thought process when you have something like a school shooting happen is either, oh, more guns would solve the problem or catch this, immediately using it as a platform to say this is why we shouldn't have guns. Mm -hmm. Both of those miss the rabbit. The rabbit has passed you by as far as what it means to care for the orphan and the widow, what it means to practice true undefiled religion. And that's the importance of why of how this becomes applicable because we can sit here and talk about the concepts of the living kingdom and all of that and yes these these theological concepts are important to unpack it is important to understand the paradigms and the parameters of what it means to be christocentric but folks there is a very tangible reality to all of this that is very present because the reality is is that it is unenviable by the world standards to stand in the gap however the number one responsibility of the christian and it does not matter if they shop at target it doesn't matter if they who they sleep with it doesn't matter 
who they vote for. It doesn't matter what denomination they are. It doesn't matter what color their skin is. It doesn't matter how much money they got. It doesn't matter what gender they are. And I say that inclusively. I mm -hmm. don't just mean that in a A or B sense. And it doesn't matter where you fall in thinking that this is right or that's right or this is this and this is that. Your number one responsibility is to love and care. Doesn't non believer, believe all of that does not love and care. How do you get there? You get there by way of having a Christ centered theology. That's why this is so important. That's why this is one of those topics where when, when Andrew approached me, you want to talk about this? Yeah, I want to talk about this because this is something that matters because this is something that has every single day stakes attached to it. This is the essential. Yes. Right? Th this is the essential. Because that's even even part of what you're talking about there as far as the idea of, you know, people that lead with fear God. You know, don't this was something I was accused of yesterday also. You don't fear God enough. And the reality is, what is it that we see in Scripture from a Christocentric point of view in the in Hebrews? Hebrews, if if you want to find a book that is talking Christocentric theology, the book of Hebrews is where to go. Right. And what does the writer of Hebrews say? We are now told to boldly enter the presence of God. Yeah. Fearing God is not fear mongering. Fearing okay. God is recognizing what we read in Colossians 1, that Christ is the image of the invisible God. Right. And he reconciles everything to himself. Yeah. And he has now called us to go and do the same. That's what fearing God looks like. We talked about this. Bray and I talked about this back when we when we were doing things like the gun rights stuff. The first responsibility within a Christocentric mindset when tragedy strikes is empathy, not politics. Right. And then that on either empathy, side of, right. of politics. And then that empathy, a Christocentric level of empathy, will inform what our political reaction should look like. The first thing that we should do when we see somebody struggling is not ask to see their membership card to know which church they belong to. Right. We pick them up, we take them in, and then we pay for their bills, just like we see in Luke chapter 10. That is what a Christocentric gospel looks like, and that is what it does for us as believers, is that it allows us to experience what Paul says as a renewing of our mind. Because when our mind is renewed in a Christocentric setting, a Christocentric mindset, we are able to approach the throne boldly, and we are able to go and love our neighbors and our enemies boldly. That is why this matters, because our, our theology informs everything else. And if it is Christocentric, then we are going to stay on the right path. Because if it's Christ-centered and that's what we're doing, we're going to be going towards Christ, which is the goal. Mm -hmm. And if our actions outside are Christocentric, then it's going to draw people towards Christ as well. And so we will be able to fulfill the Great Commission of loving, loving God, loving our neighbors, making disciples baptizing them, teaching them, and the cycle continues. Mm -hmm. Because if Christ is at the center, Colossians 1 is going to happen where everybody will be reconciled back to Christ. Right. So we said some very heavy things that may or may not have made some people very angry. Let us know. Again, you can find Joe over at BuddyWalkWithJesus.com. You can find us at MinistryMisfits.com. You can do all the, the different things there. All the social media stuff, we're at Ministry Misfit. 
Joe is kind of on social media, just he's kind of hard to find because he's very intentionally discreet about how people can get a hold of him online. So next week, next week, Brandon should be back. We've got a couple of guests lined up over the next couple of weeks. Um, we are still going to, even though Joe and I did dive into it a little bit today, Brandon and I still are going to actually do the full gospel walkthrough here once he returns back from Colorado. Um, again, birthday month, June 1st through June 30th. Now that we have somebody that knows how to read a calendar on the show to help us, we will see all of you next week. The Ministry Misfits podcast is a production of Ministry Misfit Media in association with Overwhelming Victory. Dr. Greg Linville and Andrew Fouts are our executive producers and Brandon Simmons is associate producer. The Ministry Misfits theme song is written and produced by J.D. Laird and Laird Creative Agency. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at ministrymisfitmedia at gmail.com or by following at Ministry Misfit on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also visit our website at www.ministrymisfits.com or through bio.link backslash Ministry Misfits. If you would like to support Ministry Misfits, you can become a patron by going to patreon.com backslash Ministry Misfits. 